Acts chapter 9. Last week was the first Sunday of 2020, and we talked about uh, the idea of what is your 2020 vision. And we saw that, of course, from the text here. We'll look at that again. I want to refresh our memory just by reading the scriptures if we can, and then I'll get us to where we were last week, where we left off, and share the last two answers of the Lord from this text. Remember, we began asking that question, Lord, what will thou have me to do? And I want to continue with that this morning. But Acts chapter 9, and we'll begin reading in verse 1. And Saul, yet breathing out threatenings and slaughter against the disciples of the Lord, went unto the high priest and desired of him letters to Damascus to the synagogues, if he found any of this way, whether they were men or women, he might bring them bound unto Jerusalem. And as he journeyed, he came near Damascus, and suddenly there shined round about him a light from heaven. And he fell to the earth and heard a voice saying unto him, Saul, Saul, why persecutest thou me? And he said, Who art thou, Lord? And the Lord said, I am Jesus, whom thou persecutest. It is hard for thee to kick against the pricks. And he trembling and astonished said, Lord, what wilt thou have me to do? And the Lord said unto him, Arise, and go into the city, and it shall be told thee what thou must do. And the men which journeyed with him stood speechless, hearing a voice, but seeing no man. And Saul arose from the earth, and when his eyes were open, he saw no man, but they led him by the hand, and brought him into Damascus. And he was three days without sight, and neither did eat nor drink. And there was a certain disciple at Damascus named Ananias, and to him said the Lord in a vision, Ananias, and he said, Behold, I'm here, Lord. And the Lord said unto him, Arise, and go into the street which is called Straight, and inquire in the house of Judas for one called Saul of Tarsus, for behold, he prayeth. And hath seen in a vision a man named Ananias coming in and putting his hand on him, that he might receive his sight. And so last week we gave the title of the right question. The right question. We find the question there in verse 6. Lord, what will that have me to do? And challenge you to ask this question to the Lord. And we looked at God's answer here from this text. We first of all see, he says, Lord, what will that have me to do? And the first thing God says is, hear my voice. The Bible tells us there in verse uh, number uh, 7 that the other men didn't hear it, but he did, hearing a voice but seeing no man. But God spoke to Paul, and Paul heard it, or the Paul, Apostle Paul would be at this time. He's called Saul. Hear my voice. And we see the conversion of Saul here and how no man could have stopped this murderous man. He had stood there at the stoning of Stephen. He was putting people in prison. Now they've left Jerusalem scattered from Acts 8 verse 1. We know that. So he's chased them into Samaria and to Damascus. And he has letters to do the exact same thing. No man could have stopped this passionate, murderous, white hot anger he had towards God and the people this way that Saul had at this time. Except for Jesus. No man on this earth, but the Lord met him in his path with nail-pierced hands and spoke to him. And we see the Lord, the soul, great soul winner, the Lord Jesus, wins him to himself. And, and here, the soul puts his faith in Christ. We'll look at that a little more in just a minute. But he gets saved. And I love this. God, after the humiliation of Jesus, his son, and after him coming to this earth and being born, and you imagine... As adults, going back to being a baby, never mind God being a, coming and, and robing himself in flesh and being a baby and growing up and going through the uh, obedience of being a man and a servant, a man of poverty, no place to lay his head, and then to go to the cross and become sin for us on Calvary. And all that he went through, and because of that, Philippians 2 says, God has highly exalted him and given him a name which is above every name, that the name of Jesus every knee should bow. Uh, of things in heaven, things in earth, things under the earth, and that every tongue should confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. And so that's exactly what had happened. God's, the Bible says in Acts 8 that when Stephen was stoned, that he said, I see the Son of Man standing on the right hand of the Father. So Jesus is already seated on the throne. It's already there. God had put Jesus on the throne of the universe, but Saul had to make a decision for himself to put Jesus on the throne of his heart. I'm going to tell you right now, Jesus is Lord. And if you don't confess Him before you leave this earth, you will find out one day, and everybody from the atheist 
uh, to, the, to the person that uh, is religious, whether Islam or Hindu or whatever, or, or, or Baptist, if they haven't received Christ as Savior, doesn't matter how religious you are, they're going to find out one day, though, and every knee shall bow, the Bible says. Every tongue will confess. But if you don't do it before you leave this earth, the Bible says you'll go to a place called hell for all eternity. But Jesus wants you to receive him today. That's why you're here if you don't know him as Savior. He says, for whosoever is a call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. That if thou shalt confess with thy mouth the Lord Jesus and believe in thine heart that God hath raised him from the dead, thou shalt be saved. And that's what God wants you to do. No question about that if you don't know him. That's what was happening, of course, in Saul's life as the Lord presented himself to him. But he still had to make a choice. And I'm going to tell you, the same goes for every one of us. If you're saved here this morning, you know why. You made a decision one day. You decided for Christ and received him as your Savior. For as many as received him, the Bible says. For as many as received him, to them gave you power to be, uh, become the sons of God, even to them that believe on his name. And I hope that's you this morning. If not, I want to challenge you. We have the invitation just a minute to come and receive Christ. Repent of your sin and trust him as your Savior. The Bible says to him that he that cometh to me, I will no wise, I will no way cast out. You come to me, he'll receive you. The Lord Jesus promises that. Oh, what a miracle here happens. And we talked about how the Lord speaks to us. And, and I'm saying, the Lord's saying, hear my voice. And God wants to speak to you this morning. He speaks to us through his word and his spirit. And we talked about three ways, the word of God. And through uh, circumstances, no doubt, as they point us back to the word of God. And through other Christians, God uses uh, to speak to us. And then secondly, Lord, what will I have me to do? Hear my voice. Secondly, see my vision. See my vision. We see that here. The Bible tells us that he saw something. He has seen in a vision, verse 12. Paul saw here, has seen in a vision. And God wanted him to see a vision. We're going to see a little more about that in just a minute. The vision God had for his life, verse 16, it says, For I will show him how great things he must suffer for my name's sake. And we talked about see a vision. First of all, the vision you need to see is God. Isaiah chapter 6, Isaiah got a vision of God high and lifted up. And the, the, the servants cr crying, holy, holy, holy is the, the Lord of glory. The whole earth is full of his glory. And the place shook, the Bible says. And, and, and what a scene he saw. And he, he come and kneeled before the Lord. Woe is me, I'm undone. And I've seen the king, the Lord of hosts. And his response, of course, was here, my Lord, send me. I, I'm I, anything. You're the great king of kings and Lord of lords. We need a vision to see who God is, first of all. Then we need to see His vision for our life. All of us have some plan for our life, something we think we're going to do. But it's not about your vision. God's will is such a thing that if you were smart enough like God, it's what you would choose for your life if you were smart enough to choose it. But the truth is we're not smart enough because we don't know the future. Only God knows that. So we must resign ourselves. We must yield ourselves to His will every day. Like Paul said, I die daily. Every day of my life I've got to say, Lord... I surrender again. Lord, I'm reporting for duty again. Lord, uh, take me and use me. Guide me. I die to myself, my flesh, my way. I want your Holy Spirit to guide me. I yield to you. Fill me with your Spirit. Not your vision for your life, but God says, see my vision for your life. I'll tell you, it's way better. Way better. God has a plan and purpose for your life. Praise the Lord for that. See my vision. I love what Ironside said, the glory that shone from the face of Jesus blinded Saul of Tarsus forever to all the glories of earth, to all the thought of self-righteousness. It's like that song we sing, turn your eyes upon Jesus. Look full in his wonderful face and the things of this world will grow strangely dim in the light of his glory and grace. And that's what happened to Saul, no doubt about it. He gave his life to the Lord. God's called us first to be with him and then to live for him. He sent his disciples forth to preach, Mark 3, 14. And then a vision for the world. You know, sometimes we can get bothered by the world and think, good night, they deserve hell. Well, the truth is, so do you, so do I. They just need a Savior. They need someone to help them to know Jesus, to introduce them to Christ. But God wants us to get his vision for the world. He didn't come to condemn the world, but that the world through him might be saved. And so we need again to get a fresh new vision of God's will and way, his vision for this world. And the Lord help us to be that faithful witness that he's called us to be. That was where we ended last week. All right, so there's a 40-minute message in 10 minutes, all right. Whatever it was, okay, 45 minutes or whatever. Number three, all right. Lord, what would I have me to do? The third thing is God says, be my vessel. 
be my vessel. Look at verse number 13. Then Ananias answered, Lord, I think his voice cracked there, Lord, <laughs> I've heard by many of this man how much evil he had done to thy saints at Jerusalem. And here he hath authority from the chief priest to bind all that call on thy name. But the Lord said unto him, Go thy way, get this, for he is a chosen, what? Vessel unto me. To bear my name before the Gentiles and kings and the children of Israel. For I will show him how great things he must suffer for my name's sake. And Ananias went his way and entered into the house and putting his hands on him said, Brother Saul, the Lord, even Jesus, that appeared unto thee in the way as thou camest, has sent me that thou mightest receive thy sight and be filled with the Holy Ghost. This just dawned to me. That song, Family of God, my family used to sing that uh, growing up. My, my parents are our family. And uh, we sang the Family of God. You may notice we say brother and sister around here. That's because we're a family. And these folks are so dear. It's a Bible thing. He said, Brother Saul. <laughs> That's why, right? And we are. We're in the family of God, brother and sister. Anyway, that was free. Verse 18. And immediately there fell from his eyes that it has been scales. And he received sight forthwith and arose and was baptized. And when he had received meat, he was strengthened. Then was Saul certain days with disciples which were at Damascus. So, number three, be my vessel. Lord, what would that have me to do? And the Lord answers, be my vessel. I imagine, you've got to put yourself in the story, right? I imagine Ananias gulped a little bit as he heard, Saul of Tarsus, <laughs> I've heard of this man. <laughs> Lord, are you sure? Is this you or the devil? You know, I think he was serious about this. This is dangerous. He has a letter. He can bind all that call thy name. If I show up saying I'm a Christian, I mean, this is real. This is serious. Boy, go to him. Are you sure? And God says, obey. And he does. That's pretty amazing, too. One thing I love about this story, we never hear about Ananias ever again. You hear about a different Ananias in Acts 5, of course, but this is a, this is a totally different. But God has his people everywhere. Here in, in the city of Damascus, and I don't, know, I don't know anything else about it, but Ananias is there, and he's a servant of God, and God tells him to do something, and he does it. I love that. And Ananias shows up and does exactly what God says. But you would imagine if God called you to go to this guy, he's killed people. We already know what he did to Stephen. He's in prison and killed others. And now you're to go to him and reveal yourself as a Christian. He's a man of faith, a man of obedience to God. He does. He goes and meets him. It shows you what God sees when he looks at a sinner when he talks about Paul. I mean, Saul at this point. This guy just got saved. I mean, just three days now. God says, I'll tell you something. I know what you see, but let me tell you what I see. You see a murderer. You see someone that wants to persecute Christians, but I'll tell you what I see. I see someone that wants to live for God. I see a chosen vessel unto me. Bear my name. It's powerful. Think about what God sees when he looks at you. He says, well, I don't know what I can do for the Lord. Well, you and me can't do too much. But God says he's a vessel. Oh, this is good now. The Bible says we have this treasure in earthen vessels. You, you and me, we're just dirt, water, mud, if you will, clay. God says, I put a treasure in you. The treasure in you, okay. Some of these, you know, when we're young men or maybe young ladies, they think they're God's gift to men or God's gift to women. You're not the treasure. The treasure is what's in you. Jesus is the treasure. And he says, I've chosen him. God's going to use this young man. God wants to do something. Now, we know he's young from Acts chapter 8. They laid their, they laid their robes, their, their clothing uh, at the feet of this young man. So the Bible says, end of Acts chapter 7, when they were stoning Saul. He's a young man. God says, I can see what I'm going to do with his life. Praise the Lord. Isn't that what we all, all are? You say, he's a sinner. He's killing people. You're right. But isn't that what we all are? We're just chosen sinners. Just chosen sinners. We're all sinners, but God says, I've chosen. Turn to Acts 22. Remember I told you last week that I was going to show you both in Acts 22 and Acts 26. Paul gives his testimony in those places too. Look at Acts chapter 22 and notice verse 14 and 15. 
The Bible says, and he said, the God of our fathers, Acts 22, verse 14. Same story. I'm not going to back up and read it all, but you can see here comes he is in verse 13. Ananias comes in, brother Saul, so on. Verse 14. And he said, the God of our fathers hath chosen thee that thou shouldest know his will. Can I tell you this morning, God desires you to know his will. He has a will and plan for your life that's special for you. There's no question about it. And see that just one. Oh, if we could get a glimpse of the Lord Jesus, it's capitalized, that just one. Let's talk about Jesus. And should us hear the voice of his mouth. I told you God said, hear my voice. Hear the voice of his mouth. For thou shalt be his witness unto all men of what thou hast seen and heard. God's chosen him. I'll tell you, God's chosen you and God has a plan for you and a will. And he wants you, he said, to know his will and hear his voice. We're going back to Acts 9 now. And to be his witness. John 15, 19 says, if ye were of the world, the world would love his own. But because ye are not of the world, but I have chosen you out of the world. Therefore the world hateth you. John 15, 19. Ephesians 1, 4 says, According as He hath chosen us in Him before the foundation of the world, that we should be holy and without blame before Him in love. God has chosen you. You say, well, does that mean, are you, are you saying you're a Calvinist? No, 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 no. I believe God chose the whole world on Calvary. The Bible said, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. He chose everyone. He died and paid, I believe, the full sin debt for all mankind. Past, present, future from Adam all the way on to the end of time. God has offered to all men. The Bible said he tasted death for every man. It's paid in full. But not everyone in this world has chosen him. And God would not be God if he didn't know all things. So he knew of course, who would choose him? But I believe he's extended his hand and reached to everyone. I love what Spurgeon said. He said, the best way I know how to explain it is when we get to heaven, over the gate of heaven, and say, whosoever will may come. But as you pass through the gate and look back, it says on the other side, chosen from the foundation of the world. <laughs> Only God could do that. I believe with all my heart that God loves you, and no matter who you are today, God wants to save you. And God has a plan for your life, a will for your life, His desire. The Bible says it's not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. His desire that you would know Him and then live for Him. And He has a plan for you to be His witness. No doubt about it. His blood was sufficient for all men. I want you to notice what He says here when it says, he, I want Him to be my vessel. Back in Acts 9, notice in verse number uh, 15, the Lord said unto him, Go thy way, for he is a chosen vessel unto me to, what? Bear my name. Bear my name. The first Corinthians 6, 19 20 through 20 says, What? Know ye not that your body is a temple of the Holy Ghost which is in you? And ye are not your own, you are bought with a price, therefore glorify God in your body and in your spirit which are God. So it's interesting, God says, you're, you're a vessel. Paul, you're a chosen vessel. I've got a vessel here. It's not a very valuable vessel. It's a plastic one. I'll sell it to you for a good price. But uh, it's just a little, but it is a vessel and it bears something. If it had motor oil in it, I wouldn't be interested, you know. It has water in it, praise the Lord. But the value of this is not the vessel so much, because it's not worth that much. The value is what's in it. And God didn't say, I've made you a golden signet. I've made you some golden scepter. No, you're not that. You're a vessel. But I'm telling you, I made you a vessel so something valuable could live inside you. And that's the value. He says, I, want, I made you a vessel, and this vessel is for something. It's to bear his name. Oh, you're valuable. You're going to bear his name. I mean, it's almost like that little donkey that God was going to use to ride in on Palm Sunday. It was just a donkey. The donkey wasn't anything special, but the donkey carried something special. See? 
So it's not you and I that's special. Paul says, I'm nothing. I'm the chief of sinners, but I am what I am by the grace of God, and it's not me, but Christ liveth in me. Galatians 2.20. That's what's special. It says, I've called him to bear his name. How do you bear his name? By being a witness. Jesus would say in Luke 24 there, after his resurrection, he gives the Great Commission, he says, and ye are witnesses of these things. Notice what he says here, to bear my name, verse number 15, before the Gentiles and kings and the children of Israel, for I will show them how great things he must suffer for my name's sake. Over there in uh, Acts 22, he said, and be my witness. He's to be my witness. God's called all of us to be his witness. No question about that. You know, we used to brand, and maybe they still do brand cattle. We got the ladders here. You all brand your cattle? Where are they at? There you are. You all have them brand on them? Okay. And so we, they would bear a name, and everyone would see it. No, uh, God wants us to bear His name, that everyone that would see us would know who we belong to, and what we are about, and what our life is meaningful. We're, this, their cattle don't live for themselves. Their cattle live for them. They are the owners of them that feed them and take care of them, and they, are, they go and do whatever they have them go and do. They're for their use. I'm not talking about wearing a Jesus T-shirt or something like that. I, I mean, about really... Talk about really bearing his name. For instance, it's 2020, right? The Jetson car is supposed to be out 2020. I was told that when I was a kid. Let me watch the Jetsons. I know this isn't spiritual. Bear with me. All right? And the Jetson flying car is supposed to be out, but they're not out. But if it came out and you had it, and inside the Jetson car came the Jetson robot, the new and improved version, and that robot, while you're at work, would clean the house. It would do the laundry, fold it, put it away. It, you get home, dinner's ready, you know, everything. I mean, you'd go to work saying, this thing's changed our life. you got to get one of these. This has changed our family. We don't have to get home and cook and things. It's all ready. The laundry's done. It washed the car. In fact, the Jetson car breaks down. The robot knows how to fix it. This is the best thing ever. you got to get one. You'd be telling everybody. You may not wear the T-shirt, but everyone would know. Here comes that Jetson crazy guy. I mean, he loves that floating car, you know. I mean, that's what they would tell you. You would be known by that. You would be branded by that. Some of you are like that about Alabama or Auburn. Right? Some of us are like that about whatever. Everyone knows you always wear Nike stuff or I don't know. But you, there's something about your life that's known. God says that I want you to be a vessel that bears me. Bear my name. And everyone that knows you, meets you, come across you, you'll infect them with the same thing. They'll know about Jesus. Now, they have to choose to place Jesus on the throne of their life or not, but they will hear about Him because you will be a vessel that bears me. Oh, may God help us. This is what Paul was. This is what God called Paul to be, and I believe God's called all of us to that. Ye are witnesses of these things. He says, ye shall receive power, Acts 1.8, after that the Holy Ghost has come upon you, and ye shall be witnesses unto me, Acts 1.8. Where? In Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and the most part of the earth. Both, he says. You know, we'll bear the name of everything else, won't we? We'll talk about our favorite show and that, that new, new outfit or new gun we bought or new whatever you're into. Uh, you'll talk about your favorite restaurant or this food you came up with or found out about or this great deal you found. And we'll talk about everything. Why won't we bear his name? Why do people not hear about this from our lips? This is the greatest thing that's ever happened to our family. Can I ask you, is it not the greatest thing that's ever happened to your family? Is Jesus not the greatest thing that's ever happened to you? Why don't we talk about it? Why don't we bear His name everywhere we go? Has He not changed your life? Oh, this Jetson robe, but I'll tell you, no, no. Has Jesus changed your life? You know if you're saved, He's changed you. Why don't we go to work saying, oh, you've, got to, you've got to know the Lord Jesus. I'm telling you, this has changed our life. We could be divorced, but God did something. Hey, our family could be in shambles, but God did. Hey, our, our child was this or that, or, but the Lord did. Why don't you young people go to school saying, I'll tell you, life isn't about uh, the coolest clothes or sports or some movie or whatever. Life is about having purpose. God has given me a purpose for my life. Why don't we bear his name like that? Why don't we do that in our homes, in our neighborhoods, and wherever you go, to bear His name. I'm telling you, 
You read the life of Paul, he never got over this. Jesus came to live within him, and he knew it. There was no question about it. See, this is where we miss it. I think many of us have trouble. Four letters, L-O-V-E. The Bible says, love not the world, neither the things that are in the world. For the love of the world, the love of the Father is not in him. For all that is in the world is less flesh. It says other things there, but 1 John chapter 2, 15 to 17. You say, I love Jesus. John 14, 15, if you love me, keep my commandments. Look, Jesus did something that proved God's love for us. No one could ever ask, and if they do, it's because they're misinformed. No one could ever ask, I don't even know if God loves me. Hey, could you imagine if I gave you one of my children, one of my daughters, I allowed their life, maybe a kidney or heart or something, I allowed them to die so you could live? Can you imagine the sacrifice that that would be? And if you would ever question my love, I would say, are you crazy? I gave you my child. See, anyone to question God's love is, is misinformed, friend. The devil has lied to them. No one could ever question his love. Greater love hath no man than this, than a man lay down his life for his friends. John 15, 13. No way. But if you'd like to love me, if you'd like to be my friend, that's what Jesus is saying. If you want to show friendship to me, I, I've, I've shown to you. Thank God that's not all he's done. Every day he loaded us with benefits every day. His mercy is new every morning. We could go on and on, right? But if that, that's enough. But he says, if you love me, keep my commandments. Oh, I love the Lord, 1 John 5, 3, for this is the love of God. You don't get to define what love is. God says this is the love of God, that we keep his commandments. And hey, if you love him, his commandments are not grievous. You remember the story in the Old Testament? That Jacob wants to marry Rachel. And he works for seven years. That's a love right there. Some of you girls are getting duped. Some guy gives you a little note or a little flower, a little chocolate bar, and you're going to say, oh, he loves me. Hey, Jacob worked seven years. <laughs> That's love. And the Bible says it was like a few days. It seemed just like a few days for the great love he had for her. Just a few days. Hey, if you love Jesus like God, God wants us to love him, if you get to know him, you will love him like God wants to know him. Not only will you keep his commandments, his commandments are not grievous. This isn't a weight to be bore around. This is something that is wonderful. I get to do something? The psalmist says, I, I just, I'd, I'd, be, I'd be willing to be a, a doorkeeper of the house of God than to dwell with the wicked. I'd do anything. Just let me in this thing. Oh, do you love Jesus this morning? Bear his name, let her be under this. I want you to think of suffer for his name. Ooh, that's not popular. Notice verse 16. For I will show him how great things he's going to do for me and be really popular. That's not what it says. For I will show him how great things he must suffer for my name's sake. Now, this is interesting. Now, Paul did suffer. If you want to read about his suffering, read 2 Corinthians chapter 11. Three times he received these beatings. He's stoned to death. He's beaten with rods. Never mind the cat of nine tails, 39 stripes. Oh, man. He, was, he, he suffered. Imprisoned, shipwrecked, on and on. Wow. You know, we want God to supply our needs. And the Bible says, and we love the verse, Philippians 4, 19, but my God shall supply all your needs according to his riches and glory by Christ Jesus. But did you know, before Paul ever wrote that in the book of Philippians, he wrote this verse. Philippians chapter 1, verse 29. For unto you it is given in the behalf of Christ, not only to believe on him, but also to suffer for his sake. See, what about suffering for his name? Hey, we shouldn't have to suffer. Hey, he suffered for us. We must bear the reproach of the cross of Christ. Christ said, if they hated me, they're going to hate you. See, Mary, the Bible says, suffered. Sword pierced through her soul. Notice the order. If you truly will bear his name in verse 15 here, I believe you'll suffer for his name. You say, I've never suffered the Lord. Maybe it's because we're not truly bearing his name. Well, if I talked about Jesus all the time at work, you know, I might lose my job. Well, hold on. Who gave you that job? Oh, by the way, who gave you the breath and air and strength and, and health to go to that job? I'm not saying to 
rob your employer and not do the work you're supposed to do, but you ought to be known. Somehow you get that Alabama talk in. Somehow you talk about the weather, or you talk about your car, or somehow you talk about that show. Hey, where are we inserting the Jesus talk? Bear His name! That's your purpose. Maybe that's why we're not suffering, because we're not truly bearing His name. I'm not saying you ought to want to suffer. I'm not saying that. I get that. I don't want to either. But I'll tell you, there is a fellowship of suffering. Paul talked about that, that I may know him, Philippians 3.10, and the fellowship of his suffering. Guess where the three Hebrew children met Jesus, and the only time they ever did, in the fire, in that burning, fiery furnace. I don't want to go into a fire. I don't either. But that's where they met the Lord. Why won't we bear his name? Oh, you say, well, I bear it, you know, at church and things like that. No, I'm talking about truly being out and out for Jesus. Look, if, I, if you and I were, this church would be full. People would be coming to hear about what's changed their life. Listen, people are looking for something to change their life. They're looking for something to change their family. They need help. If we would bear their name, we, we would bear his name. See, the world has no answers, only questions. I don't care if you look, talk to sports stars, you talk to music stars, movie stars, read their own music lyrics. They don't have any answers. Listen to this song, Britney Spears. Many believe this, she was talking about herself. It was a song called Lucky. This phrase is repeated five times in the song, or this, this portion. And they say, she's so lucky, she's a star. But she cry, cry, cries in her lonely heart, thinking, if there's nothing missing in my life, then why do these tears come at night? Well, something is missing. Jesus is missing. See, we ask the question, the Lord gives the answer. Bear my name. Lord, what would I have me to do? Bear my name. See, one day, very soon, we're all going to be up in heaven. If you know the Lord is Savior, we'll be in heaven. We'll hear those angels cry, holy, holy, holy. Oh, we'll see all the wonders of heaven. I'm telling you, some of us are not going to hear what we'd like to hear. We all want to hear, well done, thou good and faithful servant. But some of us are going to hear, why were you ashamed of me? You talked about everything else. You told about your favorite car and favorite movie and favorite show and favorite this and that. Why didn't you have courage to speak about me? You were ashamed of me. Oh, nothing else would matter that day. The one that died for you with nail-pierced hands is going to look at you, look at your life. Oh, we'll be so ashamed. Nothing else will matter. I was a coward for Christ. I'm going to tell you, the world is not going to come to hear me preach. <laughs> not going to happen. They will only come when they see it is real in your life. When they see this is something genuine. I've never seen anything like this before. I believe that's what the pricks were that the Bible says was hard for them to kick against. He saw Stephen. He saw these others as they were being killed and beaten and imprisoned for Jesus and for doing well. He saw something in them that was genuine. It was real. Something he never saw on the facade of the Pharisees. Oh, and he wanted that. It was real. Paul truly bore the name of Christ. And look at the results. Perhaps that's why in your own personal life and the fruit you're seeing is so little, so little results because you're not truly bearing the name of Christ. Paul said in Galatians 6, 17, From henceforth, let no man trouble me, for I bear in my body the marks of of the Lord Jesus. He wasn't talking about mutilating your body or something, although he had been mutilated and beaten by these people over and over. But he meant his life, everything. I bear Christ. I'm a vessel. Hebrews 12, 4 says, You have not yet resisted unto blood, striving against sin. Look, don't look so pious. You know if you are truly bearing the name of Christ or not. I'm not standing in judgment of you. I'm, I'm not the judge. I've got to stand before the same judge you do. But you know right now if you are. Are we bearing his name? I mean, really, I'm talking about being a fool for Christ. That's what Paul said. I determined 
not to know anything among you save Jesus Christ and him crucified. You say Paul couldn't talk about anything else. He wasn't very smart. Oh, no, no. He was well educated. He was a brilliant man. But he said, I determined. When I was around you, I wasn't going to talk about everything else. I was going to use my time for Christ. It was his platform. And I was going to talk about Jesus and him crucified. What platform do you have? What, what relationships you have, what people that you see that none of us see in the week, that if you don't be that witness, if you don't bear that name to them, they're not going to get Jesus. Hmm. Fourthly, lastly this morning, Lord, what would that have me to do? Hear my voice. Lord, what would that have me to do? See my vision. Lord, what would that have me to do? Be my vessel. And fourthly, Lord, what would that have me to do? Prove that I'm the very Christ. Look what it says in verse number 19. And when he had received meat, he was strengthened. Then there was Saul certain days with the disciples which were at Damascus. And straightway he preached Christ in the synagogues, that he is the Son of God. But all that heard him were amazed and said, Is not this he that destroyed them which called on this name in Jerusalem and came hither for that intent, that he might bring them bound unto the chief priests? But Saul... Increased the more in strength and confounded the Jews which dwelled at Damascus, proving that this is very Christ. The truth is, some of you got saved and some of your family said, oh yeah, they got religion. <laughs> we'll see how long this lasts. Maybe it's your own spouse that said that. Maybe it's your children. Maybe it's your parents. Yeah, we'll just see. <laughs> Yeah, this is probably another one of Saul's tricks. He's a smart guy. Maybe if I act like him, I act like a Christian, I can get into the Christian camp and get all the names down of everybody, and then once I have them, I'll call the soldiers in and we'll arrest all these guys. I'm going to infiltrate. But the Bible says he preached. He grew in the Lord. That word strengthen is the word dunamis. It's talking about the powerful gospel was in him. He was growing in the strength of the Lord. The same thing when the Bible says, but growing... Uh, grace and knowledge, Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, where it talked about how the strength and power of God works on us. He was growing in God. People could see it. And the Bible says it confounded them. And by it, by his life, by the change, by his consistency, by his continuing, it proved that Jesus is the very Christ. Now, why very? The word very has the idea of truly. Is this truly the Messiah? Is Jesus Truly the answer is our sister saying. Is he truly the answer? How about the Mormons? Maybe they have the answer. Jehovah Witness, maybe they have the answer. Maybe Islam has the answer. Well, the Hindu have the answer. The Buddha, who has the answer? Lost people don't have spiritual discernment. One God's as good as another. What's the difference? Unsaved people don't know. The only way they can tell is the evidence of a changed life. See, see the centurion standing by the cross and seeing all that was done, saying, truly, this was the Son of God. Amen. See, something they saw that was real, that was not surface, not for selfish gain, not for personal benefit, but it was something of God and genuine that they could not speak against it any other way than saying, whoa. They were all amazed. And that's what the Bible says. They're all amazed. Verse 21. All that heard him were amazed. Verse 22. They were confounded. He proved something by his life. That Jesus Christ was the very Christ. Saul went from killing Christians to making disciples for Christ, just like that. You say, how are they going to know it when the kid at school that always was cursing, swearing, telling dirty stories gets saved? The guy that was living like the devil at work and... Talking, talking this filthy talk and his weekend crazy party life or whatever, and now he gets saved and his life has changed. He's talking about Jesus and living for God. They're going to say, something's to this. He's not living for pleasure like everybody else. Their pleasure may be money, their pleasure may be power, their pleasure may be prestige, but everyone living for themselves and their pleasure. This guy, this is confounding. This is amazing. That's why we call it amazing grace, right? That's when they'll know. By their life, he proved he's very Christ. 
Immediately he gave total allegiance to Christ, verse 20. And straightway, that means immediately, he preached Christ, he proclaimed Christ, he declared Christ, he was telling everybody in the synagogues that he is the Son of God. Immediately he gave total allegiance to Christ. It showed that he was genuine in his conversion. Look, there are people that have been saved, some of you know them. They've been saved 20 years and we're still not sure if they're genuine in it because they haven't given total allegiance to Christ. Some of you know people like that. Maybe God's speaking to you, you are one like that. Hey, you need to be out and out for God. You need to go all in for Jesus. You need to say, I'm bought in, hook, line, and sinker. It's, I'm the Lord's. Verse 21, but all that heard him were amazed. People were amazed and said, is not this he? And on and on they said, people were amazed at the difference Christ makes. Jesus doesn't just make a little difference in your life. He didn't just put new paint on the old barn. It's not just turn over a new leaf. It was 180 degrees. Here's a guy all out for the devil. Here's a guy living for trying to kill Christians, and God turns him totally around. And now he's serving God, trying to make Christians and make disciples of Christ. They're amazed. In verse 22, But Saul increased the more in strength, and confounded the Jews which dwelt at Damascus, proving that this is very Christ. Paul was proving that Jesus was truly the Christ by the change in his life, by his persuasion and his witness. This was real. See, people could tell he really believed it. It wasn't just talk. This wasn't the facade of the Pharisees that they were used to. Let me conclude this morning. You say, Lord, what would I have me to do? Paul asked the question. God gave the answer. You say, in the end, did Paul really do what God wanted him to do? Turn, turn to the last place. Look at Acts 26, and we're through. Acts 26, Paul is the last time in the scriptures that we have it given his testimony of his salvation. In Acts 26, he's witnessing the king Agrippa. Remember the Lord said, you're going to be my witness. And he tells him uh, in verse 15 back in Acts 9 to the Gentiles and kings. Here's a king he's witnessing to, children of Israel. The king, king Agrippa, he's talking to. Look at verse 13. At midday, O king, <laughs> I saw on the way. A light from heaven above the brightness of the sun, shining round about me and them which journeyed with me. Acts 26, 13, now 14. And when we were all fallen to the earth, I heard a voice speaking to me and saying in the Hebrew tongue, Saul, Saul, why persecutest thou me? It's hard for thee to kick against the pricks. And I said, Who art thou, Lord? He said, I am Jesus, whom thou persecutest, but rise and stand upon thy feet. For I have appeared unto thee for this purpose, to make thee a minister. And a witness, both of these things which thou hast seen, and of those things in the which I will appear unto thee. Maybe it's time in Arabia. Delivering thee from the Gentiles and from the Gentiles, uh, delivering thee from the people and from the Gentiles, unto whom now I send thee. Oh, I love this. Verse 18, to open their eyes. The people are blinded. Someone's got to open their eyes. And to turn them from darkness to light. From the power of Satan the Bible says to the people in this world whom the God of this world have blinded their eyes, lest they should see the glorious gospel. Lest they should see. Someone's got to help them. And from the power of Satan unto God that they may receive forgiveness of sins and inheritance among them which are sanctified by faith that is in me. Whereupon, O King Agrippa, I love this. In the end, did Paul do what God wanted him to do? Whereupon, O King Agrippa, I was not disobedient under the heavenly vision. Oh, yes! Paul lived for God. Paul ran his grace. He says in the end of 2 Timothy 4, 6 and 7, For I am now ready to be offered. I'm ready to die. The time of my departure is at hand. I've fought a good fight. I have finished my course. I've kept the faith. Paul lived his life for Christ. He was faithful to the end, and he died a martyr's death. But you and I are still living. We have not finished, none of us in here, Unless you drop over dead in the next few seconds, right? You're not finished! Your course. But wouldn't it be wonderful to get to the end and say like Paul, I finished my course. I kept the faith. I served God with all my heart while I could. I lived for Him. This is what Paul did. Do you want that? You want to be able to say, I finished my course. I obeyed the Lord. I did what God wanted me to do. As you ask this question, Lord, what would that have me to do? And as God gives the answer, hear my voice, be my, uh, see my vision, be my vessel. Prove by your life that I am truly the Christ, the Messiah. I am the true God.
God. As he speaks to your heart this morning, will you do what God wants you to do? Will you be, as Paul was, obedient to the heavenly vision?